committee will uh, come to order. We want to welcome our distinguished panel. Um, first, we have Mr. John Graham, who is a senior fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. We will uh, start with Mr. Graham and work, work, down the, uh, work down the road. Mr. Graham, you are recognized for five minutes. You know how this works. There is a lighting system there. Make sure your microphone is on and fire away. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Cartwright, members of the committee. My name is John R. Graham, Senior Fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. I welcome the opportunity to share my views and look forward to your questions. Despite the President's assurance that if you like your health plan, you can keep your health plan, Obamacare has caused significant disruption to people's coverage as the health insurance exchanges prepared for their first open enrollment, which began last October. Insurers knew that they would struggle to price policies in the exchanges accurately. So Obamacare includes three mechanisms to backstop insurers' risk, re risk adjustment, reinsurance, and risk corridors. I will focus on the last two. These last two, reinsurance and risk corridors, are politically motivated tools that are critical to insurers' ability to profit in the exchanges through the end of 2016. Both persist only through the first three years of Obamacare. The first is reinsurance. Each year, Obamacare levies a special premium tax on all insurers, as well as self-insured plans. This tax revenue is supplemented by a little extra from the general revenues uh, to add up to a total of $25 billion over the three-year period. For each of the three years, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services must publish a notice explaining how it will distribute this money to insurers. In March 2013, HHS, HHS issued its first notice. My written testimony goes through the arithmetic, uh, which concludes that the maximum payout per expensive policyholder uh, would have been $152,000. However, at the end of 2013, HHS changed that rule, increasing the maximum payout to $164,000 by changing uh, the attachment point. HHS asserts that it changed the attachment point because there will be fewer extraordinarily expensive claims than originally anticipated. This is a remarkable claim. Evidence suggests that the exchanges are attracting older and sicker applicants than originally anticipated. For example, Express Scripts, the country's largest provider of pharmacy benefits, has released an analysis of medic medication utilization in the exchanges. Quote, increased volume for higher cost specialty drugs can have a significant impact on the cost burdens. Specialty medications now account for more than a quarter of the country's total pharmacy spend. In total spend, six of the top ten costliest medications used by exchange enrollees have been specialty drugs. In commercial plans, only four of the top ten costliest medications were specialty. More than six in every 1,000 prescriptions in the exchange plans were for a medication to treat HIV. This proportion is nearly four times higher in exchange plans than in commercial health plans." End quote. Further, the exchanges need so-called young invincibles who are between the ages of 18 through 34. However, these comprise only 28 percent of enrollees in Obamacare plans, almost one-third fewer than the 40 percent previously expected. Even worse, our understanding of the characteristics of the beneficiaries in the exchanges is deteriorating because HHS appears to have decided to discontinue its monthly announcements monthly announcements that describe these important factors. The reinsurance fund is primarily financed by a tax levied on an assumed approximately 191 million insured people in the United States. If 2014 sees significantly fewer insured people, then assumed revenues will fall short. It is likely that the reinsurance fund will fall short of satisfying insurers' claims. They will look elsewhere to be made whole, which brings us to the risk corridors. This is an unlimited taxpayer obligation that compensates insurers and the exchanges according to formulae that I have described in my written testimony. A quick read of risk corridors suggests that they are revenue neutral, but this is not the case. Payments are based on premiums paid, uh, not claims incurred. At the risk of oversimplification, if the average premium over all insurers is $10,000 and the average of all claims is $10,000, the risk corridor is revenue neutral, but if the average of all claims is greater than that, taxpayers are on hook for the difference. Health insurers appear to understand that the exchanges contain more risk than initially appreciated, and HHS has responded to their concerns uh, in a series of communications that have promised in somewhat veiled language that it will adjust uh, the risk corridors, and I quote from a letter, modify the risk corridor program final rules to provide additional assistance, end quotes. Uh, 
Also, the HHS has increased the administrative costs that it will compensate plans for if they uh, incur too much claims in the risk corridors. Uh, the HHS uh, appears to have, uh, in its most recent communication, accepted the need for appropriations, as the Congressional Research Service has suggested. And I would conclude by encouraging Congress uh, to use whatever tools and powers are available to it to ensure that taxpayers' liabilities in these risk corridors are limited and precisely quantified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham.